Okay, now that we're prepared to uh, use our manual filtering station, um, we're assuming that you've watched uh, the fourth video in this DVD series, and that's uh, Three Secrets and Supplementary Information. Contained within that DVD is how to obtain your vegetable oil sources and what the best, best vegetable oil sources are to obtain. Um, there's a lot of bad oil out there. Don't even have to worry about it. Don't even use it. Get rid of that kind of supply. You don't need it. There's too much good stuff out there to use. We're assuming that you've already gone through the tests and uh, you got as good of a while as we do right behind me here. So now, it's the next step. I'm going to put some gloves on and uh, I'm going to grab some of our five gallon containers that we've uh, obtained from our vendors. We put on our gloves and we're ready like Chevy Chase. All right, so follow me. In the system that we show you, we recommend that you do a manually, manual, filter, manual filter process first. Um, we take you through a series of five gallon buckets that we have laid out here. Each one of them is designated uh, just for your own convenience, um, micron value. We go from 600, 400, 200, 100. We have two redundant 100s. I found with mostly oil that we process, the 100 micron filters tend to take a little bit longer than the rest of them. So I double up the 100s. So now, after you've collected your oil from a reliable source, you're ready to filter. So, this oil happens to be predominantly soy. We got it from uh, a local pub that was one of our affiliates. And uh, pretty much you just follow basic instructions. You just take your jug and pour the oil into the 600 micron filter. And good oil will be pretty dominantly clear. Now we'll discuss this more in the fourth DVD. But if your oil comes out chunky, comes out as like a, I just say a, a, what do you call it, a suspension mess with a lot of particulates, and it starts clogging your filter immediately, don't even bother using it. It's a waste of your time. It's going to clog up all your filters. It may go through the six, but then it's your four and you're in trouble. Before you know it, you have to replace all of them. And unfortunately, that's caused by a lot of animal fat. Uh, people or, you know, restaurants who tend to use their oil to the point of ridiculousness. If you see that, don't use that oil for biodiesel, and I would recommend not even eating there as a restaurant. So what we do is just step up 600 to 400, just like that. Oops. 400, oops, there we go. 400 off, put it on the six. Now this is really good oil, and we typically get good oil out of this uh, restaurant. This is pretty much what you want to see. And like I said, these one minutes tend to take a little longer, so we'll just divide it up equally. to uh, filter down. I'll go to another restaurant, and this is also to show you that it doesn't matter what the oil source is, as long as it's vegetable oil. So we're gonna put this one aside. I'm gonna get some oil from a Chinese food restaurant that is also really reliable. They swatch out their oil about twice a week, and their food is really good too. So, I'll try theirs out. Again, nice and clear. Now we may need a particular level at the bottom. Nope, this stuff's really, really good. We'll show you bad examples uh, in that fourth DVD of what not to use, but this is really good stuff. So, that pretty much encapsulates this. So the reason why we typically don't want to filter straight vegetable oil is actually we don't really need to. Most uh, used and uh, 
waste vegetable oil has particulates, chunks, food particle matter in it. And that's why we use a manual filtering process. For one, uh, it's the most cost effective way to do so to get the big stuff out. And uh, number two, we don't really need to filter straight vegetable oil because it's just going to pour right through uh, this filtering station right here. just to demonstrate that all vegetable oil is compatible with your system. If it is vegetable oil, like I said, watch the fourth DVD. So, here we have one of our Atlas containers filled with vegetable oil. And we'll see how this process kind of works in steps. Take off the cap if you have one. Pour it the first bucket. Typically, we want to fill our buckets only up to about three gallons. Otherwise, I don't know, you run into some, run into some capacity issues and some overflow. We want to prevent that. So, after you filter through your six, I'm trying to just uh, piggyback. Take our six. Put it into our trailer. That is filtering. We'll pour the rest of this out in there. Now this guy will be cleaned up and uh, will be cycled in to the next uh, next restaurant site. So when our vendor and our restaurants call us up, we swap these out. Now some of your restaurants, we, we use these specifically because this restaurant in particular likes having these uh, proprietary bottles with our label on for uh, the environmental health people to come in. They see what they're doing, they get an A-OK. Just keep it away from food collection areas. Um, that way, uh, keep as clean as you can and away from food prep areas and you'll be fine. So, just kind of put it going down the line. Now, the ABC123 system cycles about 35 gallons in one single process. So, with that in mind, you only need to filter about 35 gallons at a time. And if you pay attention to the details in the SOP manual, we highly recommend that you filter your oil as immediately when you get it. Because when it goes into the next stage of processing, you want it to sit there as long as possible. That's going to allow for any water separation and any fine particulates to settle to the bottom of the automated tank. As you can see, some filters, depending on use, take longer than others. But what we do is just piggyback. Keep piggybacking. Now this guy's ready for the next. Now you see this one's taking a little while. This 200 here. One of the great things about using this system here is these filters can be reclaimed. Meaning when they slow down like this, um, typically what you can do is have extras on hand. But uh, take the one that's slowing down Use a, you know, basically use a spray hose, spray it out from the back, it'll knock all the particulates down wherever so you want. So, one less, put it inside, let it dry, check it for cracks, for, you know, uh, any type of holes and stuff like that, and you can put it back into the cycle. 
we have a couple extra of these on hand. So as soon as this stops filtering here and gets all this stuff through, we're going to swap this guy out because it's about this guy's end of life. So uh, we'll turn, the, turn it off right now. Just wait till this goes down and show you how to replace these. All right, so now that this filter has uh, dripped through and collected a lot of particulates, we're going to swap it out because it was taking a little bit of time. Um, so, like I said before, what we're going to do is just swap it out with a brand new one, and we'll recycle this one in a second. But for right now, let's continue our process of uh, filtering. So, let me just pick it back. Yeah, much faster. But that's what the, these things are designed for, it's to get all the particulates out. So they're doing their job. Getting it down to nice, clean oil. All right, so we just replaced our uh, 200 micron filter because it was running a little bit slow uh, with the new one. And I went ahead anyways and uh, replaced the two older 100 micron filters as well. In a second here, I'll show you how to clean those. Um, but for right now, we're just going to continue piggybacking with our filtering process. Now, we make it look fairly easy. We've got the magic of editing. But this can be a pretty dirty business, uh, meaning be careful how much you pour into each one of these buckets. It's pretty easy to overflow them and, you know, messes with, you know, oil spills are not very much fun to clean up. So just be careful, be cautious, keep your eye on what you're doing, and uh, everything will be all right. So now, like I said before, these 100 micron filters tend to uh, filter a little bit slower than the other three before them. So I double them up. And it might be a good idea to triple them up too. This depends on how much time you have on your free Saturday. And as before, we'll just continue to uh, pour vegetable oil from the container before it into the next one. And uh, when these guys fill, um, I'll show you how to transfer them into uh, the big filter over there, big five or big five gallon uh, barrel over there. So uh, actually, right now, let's take a break, and I'll show you how to clean those filters while these drain. We have just cleaned out our filters using a spray hose. Next step is to spray these down with a degreaser and then um, put them in your dishwasher. So any spots you see. Spray them down. You'll be surprised how well this works. It's a great way to reclaim streams, lower your expenses. Just be sure that after you wash them in your dishwasher, be sure to inspect them to make sure that there's no rips, tears, holes. If there isn't, these things are good to go. You can do this a number of times before they fail forever. But uh, that's pretty much it. Just put these in, put in your soap as you would, and uh, run them as dishes. You get yourself some clean filters. We come back after uh, spraying down our filters and uh, Lo and behold, our 100 micron filters have worked. Now, this is almost a segue into uh, chapter two, which is using your automated system. But uh, over here, we have a 55 gallon drum. There we go, a trusty 55. On the top of this 55, if you want to come over here and check it out, we've got another 100 micron filter. Now, the producer of this filtering station is Fryer 2 Fuel. I think there's some dashes in there, but it's all in our doc it's all in our documentation on where to buy this system. You could easily easily build one of these your own. After looking at all the parts and all the shipping and parsing it down, we found it was actually more affordable to buy the whole deluxe system directly from Fryer to Fuel. 
It comes delivered inside this 55 gallon drum. Easy to use assembly instructions. This should have all been explained in uh, prior chapters or prior uh, DVDs. Nonetheless, uh, we typically use a 100 micron on the top. That extends the life of your uh, bag filter inside that filter housing right there. Those are more costly than these, and uh, these are a lot cheaper. These are the cheapest, and it goes down from there. So we want to try to extend the life of our bag filters. Therefore, 100 microns here, which are redundant on our buckets over here. That way, these guys last a long time. And I'll show you. At this stage, we just take our buckets that are filtered down to 100 microns and just pour them into the top there. And those guys will drain. Now, this pretty much concludes chapter one. So, on to chapter two. Now, typically what you want to do, and this is outlined in the SOP, you want to filter the oil you receive from restaurants almost immediately. This is why. When you filter it, you're going to get all the particulates. Then you want it to sit in this 55 gallon drum as long as you can, realistically. What's going to happen is, is the water, which is heavier than your vegetable oil, is going to settle down to the bottom. Also, particulates and animal fats are going to settle down here too. So we've got our oil here, and we're cycling through. And everything's looking good. Now, warm filter. All this was cold filter. Now, on a day in Arizona like this, when it's 110 out and I'm sweating really bad, it's kind of considered warm filtered. But, if you're in a colder region or climate, or even in Arizona during the wintertime, you're going to have to warm up your oil to decrease the viscosity, let it run through this uh, bag filter and filter housing here, getting you down to 5 microns nominal. That's a pretty good baseline. In my opinion, it's really the only way to go. It gets out all the free radicals and bad stuff you want out of your biodiesel in the processor itself, which we'll get to later. So anyways, back to chapter two, um, we're filling up this vessel. Now, we have to check how much, what the contents are in here. You just take off the filter and look right in there. Right now, we've got about, I don't know, I'd say about 15 more gallons to go. At that point, uh, we'll continue with number two. Until then, I'll just be repeating the cycle we just showed you. Talk to you in a couple minutes. We've transferred roughly 40, 45 gallons into our 55 gallon drum and out that is that acts like the vessel for our automated station. Um, we're getting ready to turn this thing on. First thing you do, um, regardless of your climate, is you want to turn on your barrel warmer. Now, this is going to act to decrease the viscosity of oil and it's going to increase the separation time between your water, particulates, and oil. Um, depending on your climate, you want to turn this thing on for half hour, hour and a half. You know, you have to play with it to find out how it fits your schedule and how it fits your system, where your location is. But uh, for us here in Arizona, we turn on for about, I don't know, 45 minutes. And uh, now that it's on, we plug it in, turn it on at about 150 degrees. We'll let this sit, um, and uh, we'll come back. So I'll see you in about 45 minutes. All right, so we came back from our little break. Now we're going to... Uh, Come back to our system that's been heating for about 45 minutes. I'm going to add this little valve here. I'm going to drain off some of the bottom, which should be the stuff you don't want in your process. So if you want to come and get a close up on this, let's see. Now, that stuff is actually, that's pretty good. We're not going to need to drain anymore. I keep this thing pretty clean. A routine checking of this uh, is a good idea. Otherwise, you're going to build up your particulate water and, and uh, junk level until then it's going to start filtering through your uh, 
automated system here and your bag filter will lock up like that, which is not really what we want. Okay, so now, and probably one of the most important steps, is don't forget to turn off your heater. Just like that. Otherwise, you're going to drain this thing and you're going to leave your heater on and that causes a fire hazard in the future. You don't want that. So, turn off the heater. That's the next step. Now, we are going to cause a vacuum situation using this pump. So, in this stage, you're going to want to take off your top filter. You would probably just need to uh, put a crack in it, allow air to come through. We're just going to take it off so you can actually watch the oil process go down. Okay, next step, we're going to have a secondary system here. This is where your 5 micron oil is going to go into. We're going to release our pump. Let's see, it's a little dirty. Release our pump, put it aside, and then prepare to pour into this guy. Okay, so here we go. Now, this is a good system. You don't want to cavitate your pump, meaning you don't want to turn on your pump and have it go nowhere. Um, you want it to be open. So we're going to lock this thing open. You can hear a little bit draining in there right now. Next stage, you want to open up your valve here. That's going to allow the pump to pull. And now, with these systems open, open, you're good to go. So the next stage is we're going to plug in and turn on our pump. This might get a little loud, but you're going to hear the pump go for a while. Then, when it gets down to this area, it's going to change its it's going to change its audio frequency. It's going to start to whine. You know when that's time to turn off the pump. So let's watch it go. chapter two. We've transferred five micron nominally filtered oil into our little drum here, which has a hand crank attached to it. Next step, chapter three, is filling up your reactor. Thanks. Excellent. 
Now that we have transferred our 5 micron nominally filtered oil into our pump station and have replaced our hand crank here, we're ready to integrate this system and start pumping oil into our processor. In accordance with your standard operating procedures manual, at this time verify that valves 5, 6, and 8 are in the fully closed position and also verify that valves 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 9, 10, and 11 are in their full open position. This will allow for the oil to circulate into the processor. Valve 11 is the most important valve um, in your processing system. Uh, the only time you actually close valve 11 is after you've introduced your methoxide solution. Um, it should be open after you drain um, your biodiesel from your processor, but uh, if you attempt to pump oil into your processor with valve 11 closed as it is in this position, you're going to be pumping into a high pressure situation where the oil and air being pumped in uh, will basically fight against uh, your attempts to pump into it. So make sure that valve 11 at this time, this is the most important one, is in a full open position. This allows for air to circulate out the bottom of this tube here and allows oil to uh, easily be uh, pumped into your processor. Valve 2 is uh, of somewhat importance. Uh, the last stage of processing, uh, right before you introduce your methoxide solution, or actually during the introduction of methoxide, we're going to actually be closing off valve, valve number 2. The reason being is, is we don't want any uh, oil to be isolated from the reaction process. So if you had a previous reaction, it is very possible that your valve number 2 is in the closed position. At this time, it's in your best interest to fully open valve 2. Right now, we have already integrated about 102 liters of oil into the system. Uh, the reason for this is just to show you uh, how, to, how to put the hand crank and pump into the filter. We don't have to waste your time in showing you the whole 120, mil, uh, whole 120 liter uh, transfer. So, at this time, we're going to move this into place and uh, Show you how it's done. Okay, so we secure the banjo. Banjo is a type of uh, coupling. It's, uh, it's a really good system. We integrated it into, uh, into our entire system because they're so easy to uh, connect and disconnect. Um, hoses and tubes and stuff like that. So anytime we refer to a banjo, that's exactly what this coupling is here. So we hook our fitting um, into the banjo at valve 8 and at this time we're going to open up valve number 8 and this is going to allow us to pump oil into our system which will begin at this time. Right now, actually I'll regress, right now we've already pumped in about 112 liters of oil. Um, our target is 120 liters. We have found that if you go above the 120 mark, you run the risk of overflowing your reactor after your introduction of methoxide. So we recommend, ideally, 120. That gives you your maximum output um, and optimizes this system. At this time, we're going to commence pumping in um, an additional, looks like about 18 liters of oil. And it works just like you think it would. You can see the air bubbles coming up through the sight tube. When I stop pumping, it'll drop back down and reach an equilibrium point. So I'll go to about 130 or so, and then back it off for a second. Let it settle. Air in the system will settle down. And uh, right now we're at about 115, 112. So do that again. Ideally, we want 120, but it's not going to hurt if you get to 115 or 125. Try to keep it around the 120 mark. The reason why uh, it doesn't really matter is that the math involved in your titrations and all the equations therein uh, contains, a, you know, this is a variable. And uh, our equations are pretty exacting, so. 
you don't have to worry too much about hitting that exact 120 mark because our math will make up for the deficit. So that'll be good for now. We'll let that settle. It'll probably settle around the one, I don't know, 118 to 121 mark. So now that we're done pumping, we are going to return our pump station. But first we need to drain the oil that's still in here. Now, keep in mind, close valve number eight before you release this coupling, because you don't want uh, all this oil to spill in your shop or garage. So, release the coupling, let it drain. I'm gonna reverse this a little bit, suck it back into the drum. There you go. And we'll just let that drain for a couple minutes. At this time, the next level is, uh, the next step is to turn on your heater. So we're going to do that. So if you come over here, we took out this heating element per directions uh, at the Utah Biodiesel Supply, where Graydon Blair has constructed one of the best, if not the best, um, home brew apple seed processor diagrams and, and assembly instructions in the world. We really like Graydon Blair a lot. He's a really good guy and he's a pioneer in this industry. In that, in that uh, construction manual for this processor, we took out this element. The, elect the electrical supply here is connected to this bottom element. Our next step in processing is turning on the heating element. This is going to get your vegetable oil up to about 135 degrees, and that's our target temperature. Now that's 135 Fahrenheit. Anything above that, uh, you run the risk of having your uh, methanol, after we introduce your methoxide solution, uh, evaporate. Methanol evaporates, uh, basically vaporizes at 149 degrees Fahrenheit. So if your reactor is operating at a temperature at or near that, depending on how much atmospheres of pressure, which is probably not more than, a little bit more than one, um, you run the risk of having it evaporate within the reactor, and then you won't have a reaction occurring. It'll be evaporated within the cavity here, and uh, because it's a closed system, it's not going to expel out of valve 11. So what we do is we optimize it around 135 degrees. To do that, and right before chapter uh, 4, we're going to show you how to uh, monitor and gauge your temperature reading. And that, that is contained within the thermostat right behind this panel here. But for right now, we're just going to heat up this oil. Uh, we're not going to turn on the pump yet. We're just going to heat this oil up for Arizona time. It takes about, I don't know, half hour to 45 minutes. Uh, this is an insulated system, so it should be fairly similar to yours. I estimate that it shouldn't take more than three hours. If you have more than three hours time to heat up your uh, heat up your oil within your in your reaction, you might want to uh, look into uh, if everything's set up right, if your electric's set up right as well. So, anyways, step the, the next step is this: we take our cord and we plug it in and commence heating up our oil. We'll check back on this in about a half an hour. All right. Now that your heating element has been turned on for about half hour, 45 minutes, the oil inside the vessel itself should have been uh, brought up to temperature, depending on how you've adjusted your internal thermometer here. At this point, the only way to tell the internal temperature of the oil is to turn on the circulating pump and cycle the oil through the system. Otherwise, this temperature gauge is basically reading nothing. So, what we're going to do right now is turn off the power supply to uh, the heating element inside this box here and turn on the circulating pump at the same outlet. Typically you could keep that heating element on while it cycles through its process, but uh, for safety's sake we're going to be removing this so we don't want the heating element uh, to be uh, turned into the power supply. So at this point I'll turn off the power supply and turn on the circulating pump. Verify that your circulation is open as it should have been if no valves were adjusted since the introduction of the oil into the processor, and uh, we're good to go. So I'm unplugging the heating element, as such, and plugging in the pump. Now, focus in on this temperature gauge here, and we'll slowly see it start to rise. It usually takes about five minutes. So what we'll do is we'll cut the tape here and uh, come back when it uh, reaches uh, equilibrium point. 
As you can see, it's been about five minutes, and our operating temperature right now is at about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to kick this up just a little bit. So we're going to open up the panel above it. All you need is a Phillips head screwdriver and a flathead. Verify again that your power supply is disconnected. You don't want to shock yourself. You can just take off this panel here. Since our power supply is disconnected, we're less than a chance of shock. But these are always good to keep in place. Note here is your thermostat. Your thermostat has a temperature range of 0 or 90 degrees to 150. That makes a lot more sense. You can slightly adjust this, and what we want to do is tweak our temperature gauge below to 135. And it's just going to take a little tiny adjustment. I mean, it's almost unnoticeable. But that's going to raise our uh, heating element when we plug it back in. And uh, what we will do is step aside from this system, um, I'll put the safety measures in place, and I'll put this guy back. And uh, we can turn off our circulating pump. And re-plug in our heating element. And again, we'll step aside. Uh, for about 15 minutes or so, and I uh, will check back in with you. Let's raise the temperature. So once again, oops, we're going to turn on our circulating pump. We're going to watch this temperature gauge. The reason why we run our heating element at this stage in the processing is twofold. For one, we want to heat our oil up to 135 degrees because we're going to take a sample of it to use in our titration in chapter four. The second is because our oil comes from multiple sources. Um, in our case, in this example, we have one coming from a pub and another one coming from a Chinese restaurant. These five gallon samples have been mixed together. Now, if you previously have done titrations, uh, you may have done a titration on one of those, one of your five gallon collection vessels. That's not going to give you an overall truth to the contents of your reactor. Uh, we have 35 gallons in here, and it's all from different sources. So this averages everything out. By circulating it and heating it up, it gets, re gets us ready for our titration, and it also homogenizes our oil sample or our oil mixture within our reactor. So we'll get a really good titration that'll be a representative sample of the entire, of the entire uh, oil inside the reactor. So here we are. We're at 130. And it's starting to go about 131. I'm pretty confident that this is going to reach our 135. Now it doesn't matter. You, you could be plus or minus plus or minus 5 degrees from that. You don't want to go above 140 though, realistically. Below 130, try to hit 135. So we'll let this go. We're at 131 right now. We'll just let this go for a while. We'll move on to chapter 4. Leaving this as it is right now is not a problem at all. Um, at this point, I'm pretty satisfied that we're dialed in. Let it heat just a little bit more. And we'll plug in both the... Uh, make sure our element is disconnected at this point. We're going to screw this back on. And uh, then we'll plug in both the circulating pump and our heating element. Yeah, we're at 131, 132. So I'm pretty satisfied with how it's going. Let's begin with chapter four, titrations. In order to do a proper titration, you're gonna to need to supply yourself with the following materials and supplies. You're gonna need 
at least one liter of water distilled. Now this is a gallon is typically around four liters. A mixing bottle, this half gallon plastic paint jug works really well. A plastic spoon, coffee filter about, I don't know, an inch by inch to two inch by two inch square. Place for your waste titrations when you're done. A permanent marker. Some isopropyl alcohol. This is 99.9% .9 isopropyl alcohol. Uh, a very affordable way to obtain isopropyl alcohol is from a red bottle of heat you can get from Walmart or any auto supply stores. In addition, you're going to need a 1,000 milliliter, one liter beaker, graduated. Uh, oh yeah, some phenolphthalein as well. That's your indicator solution. 250 milliliter beaker. These little 100 milliliter beakers as well. And we're going to label these alkalized solution, oil, isopropyl alcohol, and this is going to be your titration beaker. You're also going to need some uh, pipettes. These are three milliliter pipettes, also known as five, but they're graduated to three milliliters. You can see right there. And some one milliliter pipettes, graduated to one milliliter. These hold about three milliliters. We typically uh, record all of our titrations in our composition book, also known as a lab book. And you're also going to need a one gram scale. So with these supplies, we'll be able to perform a proper titation, uh, titration. Say that ten times. All right. Next step is making your alkali solution. What you need for this is your 1,000 milliliter graduated cylinder, a one gram scale, one gallon of distilled water, your mixing bottle, a piece of coffee filter, a plastic spoon, and some granulated lye. In our case, and for Atlas Bio's SOP, we use sodium hydroxide. And uh, our supplier uh, gives us 97% sodium hydroxide concentration. You can find that percentage on your MSDS whenever you obtain uh, your sodium hydroxide from your chemical supplier. So, let's begin with the first step. Creating your alkali solution. First, we're gonna take our 1,000 milliliter graduated cylinder and we're going to pour exactly 1,000 milliliters of distilled water. 1,000 milliliters is exactly equal to one liter. And a good approximation is there's about one liter, or I should say four liters in one gallon of water. We want to be as accurate as we can, because this is the baseline for all of our titrations. So we want to get 1,000 milliliters. Your meniscus is the bottom, the bottom of the concave of your solution. You want your meniscus to line up directly with the 1,000 mark. If you could zoom in on that, we can uh, show people that's exactly what we have right now. So that's our first step. Our second step is pouring this solution into our alkali mixing bottle. And we'll just put this aside. The next step is to get our scale, our one gram scale out, and ready for use. Now, depending on what type of scale you have, you want to zero it first. In order to zero your scale, we want it to be level, and whatever point you pick to be level, that's where you want it to sit. Now this scale is zeroed out. If you want to, can you see that fairly well? Yeah, I zoomed in. Cool. So you can see that this is level, so we don't need to adjust this measurement here. But what we want to do 
is compensate for this coffee filter right here. So we're going to now zero it with the coffee filter in there. Just that a little bit better. So as you can see, that's going to wear down our scale a little bit. So we'll zero it out with the coffee filter in there. That's precisely where we want it to be. So now that that has been subtracted out and we're zero, we are going to want to move to obtaining our Y. Now this is where you have to put on some gloves and preferably some glasses. So we'll move over to that right now. When you handle sodium hydroxide, keep in mind it is caustic by definition. That means it will burn your skin, burn your clothes, and uh, anything else that comes in contact with realistically as far as organic matter is concerned. So we put on our gloves and we usually use a face shield, but because we're shooting this video, um, that would hinder you hearing me. So I'm just putting on the safety goggles and the gloves and we're going to open this container. Now before I open this, one of the properties of sodium hydroxide is that it absorbs ambient moisture in the air. So you want to minimize the amount of time that your sodium hydroxide is exposed to the atmosphere. So what we'll do is we'll open this up. We'll get our spoon that we are going to measure with. Seal this back down. Now, come back over here and adjust our scale to one gram. Hard to put our gloves, but there we go. And we're going to pour our sodium hydroxide. right on our coffee filter. That's too much. Okay. I'm going to have to subtract some. Until we reach equilibrium. Here we go. Okay, we're going to go ahead and seal this back up over here. solution. Now we have exactly one gram in this coffee. Sealed. I'm just going to shake it and uh, allow it to dissolve. And we'll just keep doing that. It's going to release a little tiny bit of pressure. There you go. But uh, just keep shaking it and try to dissolve that sodium hydroxide inside your water solution. Now we'll just take a couple shakes and in a couple minutes we'll come back and uh, Make sure that, that is dissolved, but that's how you make your alkali solution. Make sure, always wear your goggles and gloves.
when dealing with sodium hydroxide. We just created our alkali solution and it is fully dissolved in our alkali solution container right here. Using the syringe, we have extracted about 20 milliliters, 20 to 30 milliliters of alkali solution and put it in this beaker. At this time, we'll show you how we extracted the oil from our reactor and put it into this beaker. Now, we extract a sample from your processor because this is the oil that you're going to be using. If you remember from uh, chapter three, the last stage we left uh, was the processor with the heating element on and the processor's uh, circulating pump on. This is mixing the oil and it's also heating it up to optimal temperatures. So what we want to do is just open, slowly open valve six and allow some oil to come on out. I usually extract about 60 milliliters like that. And because there's this little area right in here between where the valve shuts off and it circulates, there is the possibility that uh, there's some glycerol and or biodiesel from a previous reaction stuck within that, uh, in this section right here. So this first pour off, I usually just uh, pour that away and do a second one to make sure that we're getting good mixed oil. There we go. So this is the oil we use in our titration. And at this stage it's well mixed and at a good temperature to do the titration. Cool. So that is that. That's how you get uh, your oil sample. In addition, we poured about 40 to 50 milliliters of isopropyl alcohol into this beaker. Now, making sure that your titration beaker is clean, use a towel, wipe it out, we are going to perform a blank titration. And that's fairly easy to do. You start by extracting 10 milliliters of isopropyl alcohol. And again, just like our graduated 1,000 milliliter beaker, you want the meniscus to form right at the bottom of the 10 milliliter mark. When you're satisfied that it's exactly at 10 milliliters, which this is now, pour it into your titration beaker. Next, we're going to add three drops of our indicator solution, phenylphthalein. Swirl that around. Now we're going to get to our blank titration. A blank titration is an equilibrium point, meaning it's a break point when all the solution is considered neutral. So we want to neutralize this blank titration before we test for our value. That's easily done. It usually only takes a few drops of alkali solution. You know you have a blank titration when the color persists after mixing for about 10 seconds. You'll see a splash of color initially. Just like that. Then you count to 10. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, 6, 1,000, 7, 1,000, 8, 1,000, 9, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, That actually is pretty good. So that's a blank titration right there. And that's what we want to start with when we test for our oil. So the next step is getting a one milliliter pipette such as this and extracting exact exactly one milliliter of oil. There we go. Right there. And just pour that right into the bottom. You can use this pipette to mix up the contents of your titration beaker. Just like that. Now, this is the most important step. What you want to do is make sure you have, you extract exactly five milliliters of alkali solution 
this number five is how we're going to obtain our titration number, and I'll show you how to do that in one second. So now we're going to slowly introduce alkali solution to our titration beaker. It's going to be kind of tricky with this camera. Let's see how this works. And slowly add your solution and you'll get flashes of pink. But until that color persists for a second or two, you're not near your value. So we'll keep adding until that flash persists. Slowly adding. Here we go. Getting closer. Slowly drop at a time. It's very important to make sure that this is an accurate measurement. And to make sure we do make an accurate measurement, we're going to repeat this three times. Not on tape, but just using the exact same techniques. Don't be sure, be sure and make sure you uh, clean out your beaker in between titrations. It's very important. We're getting close. See that? More drop. Now we're down to slowly drop by drop. All right, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand. And one more drop, and that is it. I'm going to put this, yep, there's our titration value right there. Oops, spill a little bit, but that, that's the value right there. It's holding color for about 10 seconds. So next, we look at our value here. Now, we have used exactly 1.2. So we're at, actually our number right now is at 3.8, but because we started at 5, we subtract that 3.8 from 5, giving us a value of 1.2. We've put 1.2 milliliters of alkali solution to reach our titration, which persists in pink for about 10 seconds. That is your titration number. And what you want to do is uh, take down your notepad here, write down the date, and titration number one. And record that value. Repeat this two more times and we are going to add up these values to calculate our final titration number. And that is that. But just to demonstrate, we'll clean that. Pour this in our waste titrations. And clean out our beaker prepare for titration. We just performed two titrations and uh, recorded our values uh, as we did previously. So right now we have three titrations. Um, first titration was 1.2, second was 1.3, the third was 1.2. Average these three values out to the nearest decimal point and we'll get, calculate our value V. This value V is going to be, in, is going to be invaluable it's actually used in uh, chapter number five to calculate our methoxide solution. So our value V for this oil sample is 1.2. That's going to be really important for us to use. So record 1.2 as your value V, and at this point, you can put your chemicals back, recovering what you can for future use. solution. And your oil, you can put this right back into the automated station. It's good to go.